Hi, I'm Chris Ilsley, Applications Engineer for Valve and Actuation at Asahi America. Today, we will be reviewing the basic features and maintenance of the Series 92 actuator. This is a Series 92 Quartermaster Chief actuator. Its standard features include our signature red powder-coated aluminum enclosure, which is NEMA 4X rated, a manual override, position indicator, and an ISO 5211 valve mounting configuration. This particular model is a basic open close unit with a 120 volt AC single phase motor and the RHM or relay heater module. Our nameplate includes useful information such as the full model number, cycle time per 90 degrees, rated output torque, motor duty cycle, locked rotor current, motor voltage, and a unique serial number. Some units may also have customer specific part number labels. The first topic we're going to cover is the manual override. Before operating the manual override, always be sure to de-energize the actuator. The override is operated by lifting the black knob, exposing the square shaft, and placing a 5 8 wrench on the flats. In rare cases, the black knob may not easily lift up. This is because the valve can import a torque on the shaft and jam the pins. If this happens, pull the knob off and slightly force the shaft closed with the wrench. This should allow the pins to free up and the knob to lift. When you want to resume normal operation, simply restore power to the actuator and cycle it open or close. Please allow 30 to 60 seconds for the shaft to re-engage the drivetrain. Next, we're going to open up the actuator. First, we'll need to loosen the set screws on the manual override knob and set the knob aside. Next, loosen the eight cover screws with a half inch socket wrench or impact driver. At this point, you can lift the lid off the base of the actuator, making sure that the indicator dial stays inside. Inspect the O-ring at the top of the cover for any signs of leaks or damage. Make sure this stays lubricated with silicone-based grease. The label on the inside of the cover shows the wiring diagram for your specific model. Inspect the flange area and o-ring for any signs of leaks or damage. Again, lubricate if necessary. Inspect all wires and connectors, making sure there's nothing loose, disconnected, or crimped. Here, we can see that the power wires from the TUR connector run through to the travel limit switches. In most units, the power wires will come through an open conduit and land on our terminal strip before coming out to our travel limit switches. The power wires then run through the travel limit switches into the capacitor and finally into the motor. When the actuator reaches its full open and closed positions and trips the limit switches, power is diverted from the motor capacitor to the RHM. This provides power to the heater and will trip either the closed or open relays, which will allow you to provide feedback to your PLC. The closed or open LED should also be illuminated. Power must remain on the actuator after the open and closed positions are reached in order for the RHM to operate. If power is removed after open or close is reached, the heater will not be powered and you will lose feedback to your PLC. The Series 92 AC actuators utilize permanent split capacitor motors, where the capacitor starts and runs the motor. Under normal conditions, the capacitor should not need to be replaced. But if the unit is cycled too frequently, or if the load on the actuator is unusually high, the capacitor can burn out. A bad capacitor may look burnt or emanate a smoky smell. If this happens, the actuator would no longer run and you will need to replace the capacitor. 
Care must be exercised when replacing capacitors as they will retain a charge after power is disconnected. To do so, use a screwdriver with a plastic or rubber handle and short the leads on the capacitor. Some actuators, those used on butterfly valves, may be fitted with our mechanical brake. The brake is mounted to the top of the motor here. This feature will lock the rotor of the motor when the actuator reaches its fully open or closed positions. At this point, power is removed from the brake. This eliminates the possibility of back driving the motor. This can happen when the valve disc is pushed too far into the rubber seat and is pushed back in the opposite direction. Without the mechanical brake, this would result in oscillation or hunting. When there is no power on the actuator, the brake is locked to the hub. When power is applied, the brake releases and the motor can rotate freely. You should hear a click when the brake releases or locks. If the brake were to fail, it should typically fail in the locked position and would not release when power is applied. You should hear the motor humming and trying to turn. If you're unsure if the brake is locked or you cannot hear the click, then you can remove the brake and try running the actuator. If the motor can now turn, the problem is the brake and it may need to be replaced. Next, we'll discuss the travel limit switches and cams. The limit switches are what control where the actuator stops rotating. When the cam comes around and contacts the trigger, it changes the position of the single pole double throw limit switch and redirects the flow of power from the motor and capacitor to the RHM. If you have purchased an assembled valve and actuator, your cams are already preset for the full open and closed positions. If you have purchased an actuator only and are installing it to a valve in the field, you may need to fine tune the cams. So let's walk through that step by step. First, with the power off, move the valve to the open position. The open position is when the flats on the shaft are perpendicular with the front and conduit entries. With a 564 Allen key, loosen the set screws on the cam. I have already loosened this one. So we'll go ahead and loosen this one now. You may need to reposition the shaft to gain access to the other set screw. Rotate the cam counterclockwise until it trips the limit switch. Then re-tighten the set screws To lock it into position. Repeat the process for the closed bottom cam. At this point you should apply power to the actuator running it to the open and closed positions and verify that they are correct. If not, repeat the process until the open and closed positions are set appropriately. Another common actuator style is the modulating series 92 which reaches a DHC digital high resolution positioner card like this one. These units are designed to be used in applications where a valve needs to be precisely positioned to control flow. The positioner works in tandem with this potentiometer to position the valve according to an input signal from a PLC or other type of controller. If the actuator was purchased with a valve, it, can, it will be calibrated from the factory and no adjustment is necessary. If this is purchased separately, the positioner will be calibrated but you may need minor adjustments. Let's walk through a quick calibration procedure to demonstrate this. You do not need an input signal connected, but power will need to be on to perform calibration. First, familiarize yourself with the interface of the DHC positioner. The vertical line of LEDs light up to show which mode the positioner is in. On our newer positioners, there is also three LEDs at the bottom right here, which will light up in different patterns to display a fault. There are three buttons on the positioner card, which we'll use to navigate the modes and control the actuator's position. If the LED next to auto is illuminated, press mode once to get into the manual FB pot gal mode. If your positioner was in a different mode, keep pressing mode 
until the second LED is illuminated. Use the up and down arrow buttons to move the actuator and verify the limit switches are set past the desired open and closed positions. If the limit switches are tripped before you reach the open or closed position, loosen the cam and set the limit switches to trip past the desired positions. The speed that the yellow manual FB Bahat Cal LED is blinking indicates where the potentiometer is located within its stroke. Place the actuator in the midpoint using the up or down arrows to move the actuator to the mid position of its stroke and note the status of the LED. The LED will blink slowly when the potentiometer is near the edge of its range and will blink rapidly when it is in the middle. If it is blinking rapidly to the point where it appears solid, then this step is complete. If the LED is blinking slowly, then we will need to adjust the potentiometer's alignment. To do so, loosen the set screws on the gear on the shaft of the actuator and rotate the gear until the LED is solid. Afterwards, retighten the set screws. Next, press the mode button once so we can set the closed position. The actuator should automatically run to the closed position as it is currently set. Once it stops, use the arrow buttons to make any necessary adjustment to the set desired closed position. Due to backlash from the gearing, it is important to only move in one direction when setting the position. If you overshoot it, reverse past the desired position and then move clockwise again towards it. Again, check the limit switches and make sure that they are not tripped. If you're satisfied with the position, press the mode button to save this position and move on to the open position calibration. Repeat the last step for the open position. When complete, press mode to save this position. If your unit is configured with the optional transmitter module that would be located here, you should now set up the auxiliary close and open positions. Otherwise, you can move on to the command type step. The auxiliary positions should be set just before the open and closed positions so that the output relays provide feedback to your PLC. This process is the same as setting the open and closed positions. When you are done, hit mode again to enter the command type mode. When the command type LED is lit, another LED should be illuminated next to the source that is currently selected. As you can see here, that is the 4 to 20 milliamp source. Use the arrow keys to change this if necessary. When the desired input signal is selected, hit mode to move on to the loss of command. With the loss of command LED lit, you are now selecting whether the actuator should run to the closed or open position or remain in the last position when a signal is lost. The LED next to close or open will illuminate if those are selected and if both LEDs are off that means you are in the last position selection. Use the arrow keys to change this if necessary. When you are finished hit mode again. The LED next to position LCAL shall now be illuminated. If you do not have the optional transmitter module you may skip this step. Otherwise you will now set the output value in the closed position. You will need a meter between terminals 5 and 6 on the output module to read this. Use the arrow keys to change the value in the closed position. When you are satisfied, hit mode and set the value for the open position. When that is complete, hit mode again and return to the auto mode. When you are in the auto mode, your calibration is now complete. Other than the topics covered here, the Series 92 is designed to be virtually maintenance-free.
We can now go ahead and close up the actuator. First, replace the lid, lining up the actuator shaft. Next, tighten all eight cover screws. Next, place the indicator now back on, lining up the flats on the shaft, and replace the manual override knob. And tighten the set screws. This concludes our review of the Series 92 actuator. If you need any additional information, please refer to our operation and maintenance manuals on our website or give us a call. Thank you.